it, it feels good to finally be able to talk about Inter Miami. I just gave the rundown on Nashville, all the great things that have happened. <laughs> We've sort yeah. of been waiting for Miami on the other side. Does it feel to you like it's arrived? I fully thought you were tra- you were doing that on purpose. I thought you were introducing Nashville, and we're going to transition <laughs> to Inter Miami and how poor they've been in in you know comparison. Uh, has it arrived? I don't. It's it's too early to say. It's too early to say. Look, it's a good run of form. Fans should enjoy it because the last two years and change have not been great. But I think it's too early to say. Uh, I, I was on another show yesterday, and I said the same thing. It's a good run of form. Good some good some better performances. I don't know if I'll say good performances. Better performances. But it's still it's still a team that's only three points off of last place. It's still too early in the year to say, is this team a playoff team? I still think the jury's out. We still need to see how this team does over a longer st- stretch. The the sample size is too small for me. In my okay, opinion. so the, take me into the what it has gone right. What has led to this winning streak? What has changed for Inter Miami? Well, I'll, I'll start with the, the most obvious and the hottest topic, which is Leonardo Campana who for me is obviously one of the hottest strikers in MLS right now. He has, I'm trying to make sure I get this correct here, five goals in the last four games across all competitions, one direct assist, and then one secondary assist, which I'm not a huge fan of, of giving players credit for. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's I know that's that's an MLS thing. But he's 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 playing well. He's playing well. And he's a conf- he looks a confident player. Uh, you, you could see it in this game. Obviously, take away the the decisive plays, the goal, and then the assist. He just looks like he's a player that's feeling it. He really wants to go to the World Cup with Ecuador. He's been capped in the past, although he's been in and out of the picture as of late because he hasn't had consistent playing time and scored consistently. Now he's starting to do that again with Inter Miami, so the conversation is coming back up again. He said it a couple of weeks ago after his hat trick against the Revolution. It's a goal of his. He even he even shed a tear uh, or he got watery-eyed when he was asked in the press conference about the difficult times he's gone through over the last two years. Oh. Um, and, and he, you know, because he talked about his family, who he has a lot of family that lives in South Florida. And I, I, I don't know if he lives with them, but he's always with them. He's always with them, as you can imagine. <laughs> as you can imagine, a, a Latino from, from South America would be with their family. Uh, and they come to the games. They come to the games, and they were there for the game that he scored his hat trick on. And the question was regarding his family, and that's when he got a little watery-eyed because he said, uh, in Spanish, that his team, uh, excuse me, his family has been around through the hard times. And over the last two years, he's gone through difficult moments where he's been injured, where he hasn't been playing, and he hasn't had that 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 taste of success mm. that he was looking for. So now, now he's finding it. It's about maintaining this level for as long as is possible. Because right now, he's he's clearly making a very big difference in in all types of ways. It's not just it's not just the goals and the assists. It's also his ability to press. Uh, the reference point that Inter Miami now has as the number nine, I'm sure we'll get into that as well because you know, Gonzalo Higuain historically has been a number nine, but with Inter Miami as of late, even dating back to last year, has been playing more as of a pseudo number 10. So Inter Miami didn't have that person in the penalty area, in the box, looking to finish things off. And it sounds kind of weird because you always, you know, you would expect someone to be there, but that's how bad Inter Miami has been since last year, generally speaking save for this late run because there was there was times if you could look at low lights i won't call them highlights low lights of a lot of plays where lewis morgan last year was crossing in mm. balls from the right and there's literally no one in the penalty area to finish it off not even it's not even like oh it's a bad cross and then the player that was in there couldn't get to it no there was nobody in the box so uh it's it's a good run of form that's it starts with campana but there there are other aspects other elements as well um and i'll just quickly say you know the center back partnership of of damian low and Amey Mabika has helped solidify things a bit with Christopher McVeigh, who started the year as a central defender. He's been playing left back out of position. Doesn't give you a whole lot going forward, but but he's been he's been sound there at that left back spot, and that's helped things as well. So you you walk through the back line, the attack as well. Uh, it feels like a lot of elements now, kind of coming together for Inter Miami in their build. Before we continue onto the field, though. What is the vibe in the stadium? What is the vibe in the fan base and in the city over what's been going on over the last three weeks? Yeah, people are excited. The fan base is excited. Like I mentioned before, the team hasn't been doing a whole lot of winning. So to finally get a little run going, it's the first time that the club has won four games consecutively in a row across all competitions. So it's it's pretty much unprecedented success for a team that has high ambitions but has struggled out of the gate. So the fans are really enjoying it. Uh, with regards to Gonzalo Higuain, you know, he, I was just told just now a little bit ago, and I tweeted it out, sources told me he was seen on crutches yesterday. 
uh, oh, at, the wow. at, at the training facility. Um, the team is saying he's being evaluated. It's day to day, but if he's on crutches, then it's, it's, it doesn't look <laughs> like a, it doesn't look good for him for for at least this weekend. For at least this weekend, so uh, you know this. We'll get a more of an update tomorrow when there's availability at training with Phil Neville. But it's not looking good right now for Gonzalo Guayne. He was just coming back from a knee injury, so you know he, he made his appearance, his first appearance since early April this past weekend, and fans were booing him. Fans were is booing that him. real? Yes, that, that actually happened. I heard it in the stadium. I, I, you can't really hear it on the broadcast. But I always yeah. go, go back and watch Inter Miami games a second time. I've done it since the first game of, it, of the team's inception. Just because when, when you see it for the first time, it's all new to the eyes. There's a lot of emotion over the course of the game. If you're working, you're, you're keeping your eyes on your computer and having conversations with people around you maybe. So you can't fully 100% focus on the game itself. Once you know the result, once you know what's going to happen, you can take a more analytical look at it. And I mean, I, th- I think, you know, that's why coaches go back and watch a game a second and a third time. Um, and even more, I think Gareca with Peru said he watched the, the Peru Denmark game that they lost the world cup like 11 times. So, no. uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I, I went back and watched it um, uh, a second time and you don't hear the booze on the broadcast that much. I think Taylor Twelman um, uh, and the ESPN broadcast crew were speaking so you don't the mic doesn't pick it up that well but the booze happened Iguain came on and he was booed now Campana was mm. being replaced he was being subbed off he actually turned around and waved his like waved his finger um and said no like don't boo so that the fans got quiet for a bit they stopped booing Iguain came on there was a little bit of a cheer there and then more booze came uh as as he took his position at the number nine so um, fans aren't happy with him. Fans fans are obviously disappointed with the lack of production. His overall demeanor as well hasn't been the best. Although, you know, I've I've covered a lot of big name strikers in MLS, and I've seen that type of behavior from other people. Whether it's Thierry Henry, I was waiting Slat- for Slatan Slat- 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 Ibrahimovic. We've seen it. I mean, it's not uncommon to see elite strikers that have played in Europe at the highest levels come to MLS and, and have this adaptation period and struggle with the, the drop in, in teammates as level. It's, it's, it's somewhat normal. Maybe Iguain crosses the line a bit in, in, in that regard at, at times, but I do think that it is somewhat normal, somewhat common when you see players from that level come, come to MLS, so, but, but yeah. So I, I agree with you. And obviously the frustration on the field is one thing. And and obviously for a center forward, right? You're so reliant on what's going on around you and, and the service you're getting. But to me, what's interesting is we're, we're hearing or sort of people are guessing the negative um, reaction he has on the team. But then you see Leo Campana do that. So is it real what we all on the outside are talking about in terms of his influence in the group? Or is he more positive than what we're seeing? I think there. I think like with anyone, there's good and there's bad. And I think from what I've seen and what I, what I've heard, there are obviously good elements to Gonzalo Higuain as a person in that locker room. But Gonzalo Higuain has always been a player that feels that the game in that type of way. He's he gets frustrated. He gets he he just he's passionate about it. It's not like he's completely indifferent to what's going on out there. There are players that exude that type of aura that exude that they're indifferent. And there's a Spanish mm. word. There's a Spanish term for it, which I mean, I could repeat here. It's not a curse word, so it's not it's not a big deal. But it's just it's it, it's the, there's called pecho frío, which means like you know uh, cold chest. It just essentially means you have no heart. You're playing with no heart. So you know Iguain does play with a lot of heart, a lot of passion, a lot of emotion. It's always been like that. It's not like this is just an Inter Miami thing. He's been like this at, at every stop he's been at essentially in his career. So um, there are there are good elements to him as a player, as a person in that locker room. Phil Neville has talked positively about him uh, over the last season and change. Actually, interestingly enough, last week in a, in a, in the fifteen minutes of training that we were able to see early on, uh, Gonzalo Higuain came back out with the team, and in one moment he was like hugging Victor Ulloa very very gently, and Ooh. it was like. It was a nice, it was a nice little moment that you know they had, and you know maybe that's something that isn't seen during the ninety minutes, right? Because you know tensions are high, there's pressure, you know, it, it's it's different when you're when you're in that in that green rectangle. It's different when you're on that green rectangle. Different sides of you come out. You know, Luis Suarez, I think he he even said that in an interview. I think maybe with Grant Wall years ago, and and that. Uh, you know, he off the field, he's a very family oriented person, as is Gonzalo Wayne, by the way. But once they step into that green rectangle and you're competing, 
and and you get rushes of blood to the head it's it's different it's a it's a you, you're not thinking clearly like you are if you're just you know walking around on your day to day it's it's completely different environment so um there is certainly good elements to Gonzalo Wayne but obviously yes there is also a bit of a negative influence in my opinion when you do see him throw up his arms again overly or maybe a little bit too much and when he's yeah and, and, and look, I talked to him in preseason. I had a one-on-one interview with him uh, before the season started, and I asked him about that. And I told him like what I've told you. I've seen other players come during their careers from Europe to to MLS and struggle and, and be frustrated, and I get it. It's normal from that sort of point of view. But I asked him if, if it's something he wanted to improve upon this year, and he said, yes, absolutely. He doesn't want to leave a bad image at Inter-Miami. And that, you know, this is the last season of his contract. This is the last season right. of his contract. They have they have a team option to renew it for another year. But my opinion, not information, just my opinion, no way in heck they, they bring him yeah. back in 2023. And I think that's it's pretty obvious for almost anybody uh, on the outside. So um, this, this could very well be the last year of his career. It could very well be the last year of his career. His dad came out a few weeks ago and said that Gonzalo Higuain had told him, that he planned to retire after this season. Gonzalo Wayne came out afterwards and said that was a misunderstanding. <laughs> I think that I think that's I think that's damage control in the public eye. I think <laughs> I think one hundred percent Gonzalo Wayne is going to retire at the end of the season, regardless of how it goes. Yeah, he, I don't think he has any plan to go back to Argentina um, or any desire to go back to Argentina to play there professionally. And and then I don't imagine I can't imagine another MLS team would take him. So I, at this point, I just I think he's happy with with his family. Uh, you know, he has his daughter here, so he enjoys that element of, of life in the United States. And I think mm. he's re- he's I think he's ready after the season to, to bring in that new chapter in his life. Let me ask you this then, because you brought up Luis Suarez in a, in a different context before. But from what we're seeing from the team, the success of Campana, um, you mentioned the two center backs, both, you know, CONCACAF area players. Um and we still hear the connections of a Luis Suarez. Obviously, the rumors around Gareth Bale. Do you think Inter Miami has shifted away from bringing players like that in, or is that still part of the club's future? I would say, by and large, yes. But I still think there will always, if Beckham's involved, there's still an element of that that's going to be around. Mm-hmm. And, and look, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if Leo Messi becomes available, <laughs> if Messi becomes available. Inter Miami's going in. Inter Miami's going in 100% to try to sign him. Will they? Will it work? Will they land him? I don't know. But fully expect that if Leo Messi becomes available, Inter Miami will try to make that happen because not only what he can bring you on the field, but everything that comes with him off the field, it will raise the profile of Inter Miami. It'll raise the profile of MLS. It'll essentially be like David Beckham's arrival when he signed with the Galaxy. It just raises the whole thing. All, all When the tide rises, all the boats rise as well. The water rises, so they will definitely make a push for him if he becomes available again. Um, it, the team has global ambitions. The team has maybe learned from its mistakes, not go after the veteran DPs like they did with uh, with Higuain, what they did with Matuidi, which, by the way, is under a very weird... He's, he's involved in a very weird situation here in South Florida, which we can talk about if you want, but... Um, <laughs> They they'll go they'll go for the DP older DP if it's a player like Messi absolutely one hundred percent one hundred percent they they want to sell more tickets they'll they'll definitely sell a lot of jerseys they'll get way more attention in the local market so absolutely if you can get a Messi I don't think any team in MLS would pass up on on Messi maybe you know FC Dallas or the New York Red Bull or something but no <laughs> just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I I would love to see Messi rolling around in Frisco. <laughs> um, for FC Dallas. It'll be interesting with Messi. My take is if City don't win Champions League and he's available, maybe that's his first move this year and then he comes to MLS. But I'd love to see him play. I'd love to see him do his thing. Let's dig back into, into Miami. And, and Goss, 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 you know, you know, you know, when Beckham signed, if you, if you read Grant Wall's book, you know that there was a lot of other things involved in, in bringing Beckham here. It wasn't just mm-hmm. the MLS contract. There were other other... Other deals made with sponsors and everything to to pay Beckham very very handsomely, and I would imagine it's it would be the exact same thing for Messi. They'll give him a sweetheart offer to, to try to make it too good to to refuse. Whether it's Adidas, Adidas is an MLS sponsor. Guess what? Messi's also sponsored by Adidas. They can work something out there if they can give him 
X percentage of ownership of some team in the future. They'll make a sweetheart deal to try to bring them aboard. 100%. 100%. But moving from Messi, let's go to Phil Neville. Um, obviously, big name manager, the connection to Beckham. There's been, you know, a lot of talk about him on both sides over his time. What is he like as a manager? What is it like watching him work day to day and sort of interacting with him? Um, give it, people outside of Miami an idea of what of what he's like besides the 90 minutes we see. So when people ask about coaches, I, I tend to hear the same talking points. He's passionate. He's fire. He's a good communicator. With Phil Neville, he's a young head coach. He's a young head coach. And cool. he, he's a great public speaker. You, you know, and watch any press conference and you can watch it on Miami Total Football's YouTube page. He, he's a great he, – he never ever very rarely gives you a bad quote. Like he's a great speaker. One of the reasons why he was brought on board, Diego Alonso could not – communicated as well because he didn't speak English during his season here. And that's not the only reason. That's not even the main reason Inter Miami brought Phil Neville on board. But mm -hmm. being able to sell the product as an expansion team is a part of it. And and that's one of the reasons why Phil Neville was considered uh, the, the lead candidate. So in terms of his work with the team, for me, my opinion, young head coach, like any young player or any young person in, any, in almost anything, will make mistakes. And he has made mistakes. He's starting to learn from some of them, but I still oh. think he's 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 finding out who he is as a young head coach. He coached England women's national team before this. That was his first head coaching job. But other than that, his his resume is still pretty, pretty bare as a head coach. And, you know, he will grow from these types of experiences, dealing with uh, the personality of an Iguain, dealing with the personality of a Blaise Matuidi, dealing with the difficulties that someone like Rodolfo Pizarro could have brought last year. So he'll grow from these, but is he the, is he the most polished version of himself? No, he's played at high levels. He, he, he's he, obviously on Manchester United, Everton. So he's done it as a player, but as a coach, it's different. And I've had this conversation with different people because different people are like, oh, well, no, he should, he, he, he's played at the highest level, so he knows what those, those personalities are like. And sure, he might know what they're like, but it's different being one of the guys in the locker room right. that sees it and maybe helps manage it just from the day to day, as opposed to the head coach who has to actually manage it completely and have the meetings with the players and talk to them, put their arm around the player, decide when to talk to someone, when not to talk to someone, how close to get, how to go about it. It's completely different. It's a completely different dynamic. And I think he's still learning that as well as just the X's and O's of, of what he likes and what he doesn't like. From his team, he's talked both of these these two preseasons that he's been around here in South Florida about wanting a possession-based team that plays attacking soccer. Mm -hmm. But he's reverted to in both to being more of a counter-attacking team that looks for more defensive solidity. So, again, it's it's early for his career it's to, for, for me to say he's this type of coach. I still right. think he's learning. I still think he's figuring out what kind of coach he wants to be and what kind of coach he is. So, um, great, a great talker. Definitely seems to be really good at, at motivating players. Mm. Um, I, I have questions about his his overall tactics, but you know we can we can dive into that at a later point if you. Well, think. and I thought I was telling from him that he was super excited after the Atlanta game, but said the soccer will come. Like he he went out of his way at the start to admit it wasn't the soccer he wanted to see. It's not the game he expects, but the performance and the effort is there, which hasn't always been the case right. um, in the history, history of Inter Miami, which I think is fair for him to, you have to have a starting point, And that's as yeah. good a point to start at then. When we're losing 4-0 and the soccer's not there, it's better yeah. to win 2-1. Um, one of the names that interests me about Inter Miami is DeAndre Yedlin. And he's kind of like the first of a lot of things, right? He was the youngest player at the World Cup, but he was the first homegrown to be sold. And now not even at the end of his career, because he still has a ton of time to be great, but looking for his next move, he's brought back to MLS. And it feels like he's a leader and a face of this team, which is not something we've said about players who have come through the MLS Academy system in the past. What have you seen from him in his time and sort of what does he mean to this team and the market? So he was named the captain this this past weekend, which was a uh, interesting decision. I think it's the first time he's worn the, the captain's nice. armband. Uh, and look, he's quietly quietly as of late especially during this run played very very well very very well i think people have forgotten uh that he got the game winning assist in seattle on the robbie robinson mm -hmm. goal with a great cross from the right and then he got the assist on the leonardo campana goal this past weekend so he's helped make made a difference in that final third with his crossing ability ability to get forward as of late i still think there's more to come from him 
I, I think he's finding his footing now and he's, he's starting to, to feel it in terms of who he is within this team. So I think there's even a little bit more to come from him, but he is starting to perform better. Uh, there was also that, that nasty mag that he pulled off there <laughs> um, in, in the first half. So, uh, you know, he, he has an impact on the locker. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I know that they still listen to reggaeton in that locker room. I know that you still hear it from time to time. But after the wins in, in previous seasons, you would hear reggaeton like almost every single time, almost exclusively. Different okay. dynamic, different locker room. Now you're hearing a little bit more hip-hop, a little bit more rap. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, so, so I don't know if he's the DJ. I haven't, I haven't found out yet who the resident DJ is now within the team, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was DeAndre, DeAndre Yedlin because um, his, his, he definitely has an impact in that locker room. I know he's definitely being looked at by, by the brass as some, one of the players that can help lead this, this young group. He's obviously experienced, played at high levels. And like I mentioned, he was wearing the captain's armband yesterday. So, or excuse me, Sunday. So, uh, I think I think he's performing on the field now. And if he plays like that, he's going to be in the conversation, of course, absolutely for a World Cup spot later this year. So, so for, all, all good from DeAndre Yedlin so far. He's been one of the consistently dangerous wide threats that the mm-hmm. team has had. Uh, they have Ariel Lasseter. They have Robbie Robinson, who are the wingers. They're they have their moments, but they've been inconsistent to this point. DeAndre Yedlin has been more consistent, and it's important. It's important for Inter Miami because they don't get that from their left back position, and they haven't yeah. at least up until this point in the season. Again, Christopher McVay, naturally a center back, he's been playing at left back as of late, has helped solidify things defensively, but he doesn't give you much going forward. It- so to help to help out with the attack, attack that's already somewhat limited, turning to DeAndre Yedlin on that right wing, having him make those 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 marauding runs forward those overlapping runs, and then his ability to, to hit in a good cross, which hasn't always necessarily been a strength of his. It's, it's been, it's been a, a, a much-needed weapon for Inter-Miami, absolutely. Yeah, I think I agree with you, and I think it felt like at the beginning of the season with the wing backs and the five in the back, they tried to get both of them into the attack, and now you've gone four at the back, but McVie being safer, it's just unlocked Yedlin to sort of have freedom. And as you said, he's been one of the best in the league, he has, I think, only solidified, if not increased, his odds at being a World Cup player and potentially even a starter, depending on injuries now, to Sergio Dess and everyone else. It's been a pretty perfect move for him. And uh, as I said, I think it's cool that this is sort of the evolution that we're starting to get at with the U.S. soccer setup and the system and all of that. And Yedlin's been a leader uh, in a lot of the things he's done. 